I'm Newt Gingrich, Congressman from the 6th District of Georgia, the House Republican Whip, and the General Chairman of GOPEC. What you're about to see is a GOPEC training tape on leading a majority. How we, by working together, learning new skills and new approaches, can take what is clearly a cultural majority against the welfare state and turn that into a political majority in favor of a Republican, a governor, state legislature, president, House and Senate, and all the different elective offices. I think if you'll work and look at this tape, and if you'll apply these principles, together with all the millions of Americans who share our values, we can create an effective majority, and we can replace the welfare state. And by doing that, we can renew our American civilization. But I first want to suggest to you my personal belief that we are engaged in a great moral and practical effort, that we are committed to renewing American civilization. And I believe that's our battle cry, that we want to be the party and the movement that renews American civilization. And that renewing American civilization is both an idealistic cause and a practical cause at the same time. And the challenge to us, it seems to me, is how do we keep the magic for our children and for the world of what America has meant? How do we in our generation renew and revitalize this most remarkable, most unique nation, what Jefferson called the last best hope of mankind? I would argue that the simple fact is that we live in a time when the most practical is also the most idealistic when the very changes you most want in your neighborhood, in your city, in your county, are also the changes we need for the whole country. And that, in fact, we are at the end of an era, that the welfare state has failed, and that we are in the business of inventing a new era. That our movement in renewing American civilization is a movement to create a new time in America. And I, I have four propositions for you. First, there is an American civilization. And I think it's a very important concept. We are the successors to Western civilization. The Western civilization was European. It was Caucasian. It is a small semi-continent. It is backward-oriented. You have kings and dukes and princes. It has a class structure. But the American civilization is very different. But starting with uh, Jamestown and then with the, the pilgrims and the whole process of the rise of modern America, that American civilization is multi-ethnic but it's not multicultural. We represent everybody in America who believes America is multi-ethnic. But as Theodore Roosevelt said, there are no hyphenated Americans. This is not a new debate. There are Americans of many descents. And that American civilization, because it is a civilization, has a very important set of rules and principles that have to be learned. Now, the second point I'd make to you is what I call the four cans. I just use that as a way of remembering. But I think when you, if you test out this, this paragraph or this long sentence, you will find that it is devastatingly effective and frighteningly true. It's very simple. You cannot maintain civilization with 12-year-olds having babies, 15-year-olds shooting each other, 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, and 18-year-olds getting a diploma they can't read. Now, my third proposition, remember, one, we're an American civilization, and two, you can't maintain civilization with those things happening. My third proposition is the welfare state has failed. Now, Barry Goldwater took 40 minutes to explain that sentence. Ronald Reagan took about 20 minutes to explain that sentence. I simply say to folks, we're not going to debate this. Anyone in this room who does not think the welfare state has failed, go to any major city in America and watch the local television news for three nights. If that isn't the face of failure, write me a letter explaining what it would look like. So my fourth proposition. Therefore, we are in the business of replacing the welfare state, not repairing it. 
to renew American civilization, you must replace the welfare state. Now, it's very important for two very big reasons. The first is, if you think you're in the business of repairing something, you accept its current structure and say, all right, I'll stipulate it really ought to be sort of like this, but let me do two little things better. You know, a better New York City would have uh, IBMs rather than the current car, the current paperwork, or the, it would have nicer people at the front desk. I'm saying the opposite. Erase your assumption of the current structure of the welfare state. Now let's build a new system. Let's replace that. Second, I'm asserting that the core values of the welfare state are wrong about the way human beings function. You cannot reduce a citizen to a client. Establish a set of rules that are anti-family, anti-work, anti-property, anti-acquiring, anti-opportunity, and subject a human being to the petty regulations and red tape of a petty bureaucrat without having tremendously destructive impact on that person. And I would argue that the pathologies we see in the inner city and the pathologies we see in West Virginia are in fact the direct result of the welfare state and not a sign that the welfare state hasn't quite done enough. We can't stand for it to do anymore. And therefore, we are now liberated from having to try to solve their problem on their terms in their system. And we're now going to come over here and we're going to build a replacement. But, but I want to tell you what I think is the most difficult moral burden that Republican leaders who've been around as I have have to bear. There are only two sentences that define all of American political history since 1968. The first is that the Democratic Party went too far to the left under Johnson and McGovern and never came back. The second is that the Republican Party rejected the best efforts of the American people to make it a majority. For 25 years, the American people have been saying, we don't want the Democrats. Please grow up and accept being a majority. And for 25 years, we said, ha, you can't make us. We can't do much about the Democrats. They went too far to the left. They're still too far to the left. That's their problem. But we have a huge burden of responsibility to change our behavior so that everyone who wants to replace the welfare state and everyone who wants to renew American civilization has a home and it's called being Republican. And we have to really learn how to bring them all in. There are much greater differences between us and the left than there are between anybody inside our coalition. But unless we actively, constantly remind ourselves of that, they will, both in the news media and in the Democratic Party, consciously find ways to force us to split. Because they know the only way they can maintain power from here on out is to block us from becoming a coherent majority. One of the great problems Republicans have is we don't realize how huge our potential majority is. We keep walking around as though we're the natural minority when, in fact, we're the natural majority, but we can't get our act together. Let me give you some numbers. Taking just the left, the candidate of the left for president since 1968 has gotten the following percentages. This is an amazing set of numbers. In 1968, Hubert Humphrey got, rounding upward, 43%, was, I think 42.7. In 1972, George McGovern got 38%. In 1976, no one on the left could get the nomination. Jimmy Carter ran as a Southern Baptist, populist, anti-Washington reformer who was seen as socially to the right of Gerald Ford. So the left-wing candidate got zero. There wasn't anybody in the ballot. By 1980, we'd all figured that Jimmy Carter was A, confused, and B, liberal. He got 41%. In 1984, Walter Mondale stood proudly in San Francisco in a moment I will never forget. I was out there as part of a truth squad. And he stood proudly and he said, I will raise your taxes. We closed down our office on the grounds that we did not want to slow down the rate at which he got to talk to the American people. The American people said, I think he really will. He got 41%. In 1988, Michael Dukakis did not use the word liberal until mid-October and was a new Democrat. This is a quadrennial process now. And all Democrats are new Democrats because they know what you'll do to old Democrats. 
And finally, in mid-October, he said, all right, I am a liberal. He was in the, he was in the Central Valley of California when he finally said it. He got 46%. And we elected the first sitting vice president to win the presidency since Martin Van Buren in 1836. And in 1992, in a three-way race for president, the new version of I'm really not a Democrat said, I will cut middle class taxes. I will cut spending. I am for workfare. And he got 43% of the vote. And one of the reasons Bill Clinton is in desperate trouble is that he and his staff think they're Ronald Reagan in 1980 when, in fact, they're a minority candidate with a minority support representing a minority of the country. Now, look at those numbers for a second. Notice how consistent they are. Between 38 at the bottom, 46 at the top, averaging around 42 or 43. And the only reason they are that high is that the Republican Party has failed to reach out to blacks and Hispanics who are extremely pro-family, extremely anti-gay in the military, very anti-tax increase, very pro-workfare, but who feel that on ethnic grounds the Republican Party hasn't been open enough. And if we ever learn how to reach out to blacks and Hispanics, my guess is the left, candidate of the left will drop to about 30%. And just literally, just, just plummet. The Washington Post poll said, do you think the president has cut spending enough? By 77 to 6, the country said no. 77% want deeper spending cuts. Second, USA Today, do you think taxes are too high? 2%, 2, said we're undertaxed. This was the Let's Contribute group. 55% said they were already overtaxed before the Clinton tax increases. And 41% said their taxes were about right without the Clinton tax increases. Now, if it's only 96% if, if are either OK or too high, and only 2% think they're undertaxed, to come in with a $300 billion tax increase is an act of self-immolation. I mean, it is irrational. Third polling example, the Atlanta Constitution in 10 states asked Southern blacks, do you believe we should require work from people who get welfare including women with young children, which is the hardest way you can ask the question. 82 to 11 in favor of a work requirement. Now, if 82% of Southern blacks favor a work requirement, I mean, the only two places in America that don't favor a work requirement are, are the Democrats in Congress and the Stanford faculty. The Washington Post, again, asked the question, do you think government should be bigger or smaller? Now. In 1984, at the peak of the Reagan Revolution, when Reagan was getting reelected in a landslide, the answer was 49 smaller, 43 bigger. That's a six-point plurality. This spring, the answer was 65 smaller, 30 bigger. So now let me, let me rack the numbers up. 77 cut spending more. 96% were not undertaxed. 82% work requirement. 65% smaller government. You begin to see a potential majority here that's very big and very real. And if you can find a way in your district and in your campaign and in your constituency to find resonating comments and questions that begin to fit that two-thirds to four-fifths base, where people just go, oh, yeah, of course that's right. Now, the most popular single phrase of the 1992 campaign, actually uttered by George Bush, government is too big and it spends too much. More people agreed with that sentence, strongly, emphatically agreed with, government is too big and it spends too much, than any other single sentence said by anybody in the 1992 campaign. They just didn't think the president had done enough to, to respond to that reality. And so 19% of them voted for pro. And what I want to suggest to you is that, that there are three steps involved in being a citizen candidate, not one. When you go to see some kinds of consultants, they'll say to you, if I get you to win, who cares about the rest? You know, lie, smear, steal, what the heck, at least you won. Now, if you think about it, there is a corrosive cynicism to that attitude, which in the end, frankly, crippled George Bush, because he didn't keep his word. It is destroying, I think, Bill Clinton. And it's a very important concept. I want to argue that you have to win in a way which lets you govern 
so that people want to reelect you because you actually did what you campaigned on. Now, this is a much harder test. And, and I'm being honest up front with you. This is not the easy way to do it. But for the country, it's the necessary way to do it. The three steps are, first, make clear what you believe and what you will do about what you believe. Second, wage a campaign that is clear about your commitments so people actually vote for the changes they want. And third, actually keep your campaign promises so people can help you get done what you and they want and what you and they have promised. We've got to go back and say, what are the key rules that we're going to teach so that everybody's able to be an American? And I want to suggest to you that there are five basic areas. I call them pillars. Think of it as the pillars that American civilization rests on. Five pillars of progress and freedom. And I think, I think that freedom and progress are our two most powerful words. We are for freedom. We are for progress. That's how we measure things. You have more freedom. Have we made progress? Now, there are five of them. I'm going to just give them to you briefly, then I'm going to go through each one uh, for a couple minutes. First, personal strength. Now, I'll come back and define it in a second, but, but, but you can't have a free society without personal strength. You can't have a free market without personal strength. It's the most important single thing to teach the poor, because the poor need it more than the rich. Teddy Kennedy could hire a tutor. It takes personal strength to rise from poverty. Second, entrepreneurial free enterprise. Not just business, but the spirit of getting the job done. Whether it's a scientist in a government research lab, uh, General Kenny, who I'll talk about in the Air Force, uh, or somebody going out and uh, Bill Gates creating Microsoft. The spirit of getting the job done, as opposed to the bureaucratic spirit of claiming the paperwork was processed. We failed, but at least we stamped the right document. Third, the spirit of invention, I'm sorry, of, of, of invention and discovery. What is it that makes America the most successful technological society in history? Fourth, quality as defined by Edwards Deming's profound knowledge. And fifth, the lessons of American history. What is it that is uniquely American that we should learn from when we try to solve problems? Now, I think these five pillars matter because I think if you master them, and if you go back to your constituency and you look around your constituency, they will suddenly help you come up with creative problem solving in ways that are undreamable in the welfare state. The principle I want to give you is the Reagan principle of three. For your own campaign, when you win for your own first year in office, listen to the people of your district. Listen to your campaign supporters. Listen to the folks around you and pick three areas to focus on. And Reagan believed emphatically that you should always pick three areas, and never more than three, because you had to focus. Now, if you remember, Clinton went out to see him right after the election, and Reagan told him to pick three. Uh, Clinton came back. He picked uh, Zoe Baird, gays in the military, and raising taxes, which were not, <laughs> that wasn't the list Reagan had in mind. But the principle's right. And so I want you to think about it. And let me tell you what I think. The, the, there are five quick characteristics. First. The ones you pick ought to be important to your majority. That is, the people you want to vote for you ought to say, hey, that matters. And this is, what I'm going to tell you sounds very obvious. You'd be astonished how many campaigns don't walk through this. First, they just have to be important to your majority. Second, they should affect daily life. Ideology is good. Problem solving is better. The theory of nutrition is good. Let's bake bread in the morning is better. So they ought to be areas that people could measure in their daily life. Third, they have to be doable. Everyone in your district would like the fountain of youth, and it would definitely affect their daily lives. I don't think you're going to get there. So they have to be things that you can, in fact, do. Fourth, you should, if you're given a choice, pick ones that unify your side, or at a minimum, don't split our side. That is. Given a choice between one where you know you're going to be in a civil war with your own volunteers and one where everybody agrees, pick the one you agree on. And again, I know this sounds obvious. Believe me, I have been in enough campaigns in my career. You'd be astonished at people's ability to slide into a civil war on their own side six weeks before an election. When all you've got to do is say, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about this. And you just come back to the ones you want to talk about. 
Lastly, in an ideal world, not necessary, but in an ideal world, it would be helpful. It's, uh, it's good if it's something that people do not yet, on the other side, know how to, how to agree. In other words, when Reagan picked it, I mean, when Bush picked the difference with Dukakis on taxes, it was one that Dukakis couldn't fight him on. I think it's a very important model that you want to pick, you want to pick ideally, you'd like to pick topics where, where your opponent can't co-opt you. Now, you may not get there, and, and if, frankly, if you're first and you're creative and you do it right, it doesn't matter that much. But in an ideal model, you'll pick a topic which is important to a majority, affects their personal life, is doable, unifies your side, and by the way, your opponent can't be for it because his allies won't let him. At that moment, you have a huge winner. I want to talk about being a candidate in the campaign. I want to start by saying it's very important to think and act like a majority. If, if you walk into every door thinking, gee, I'll bet if they only knew what I, what I stood for, they'd be with me, you have a very different psychology and mindset than if you walk in thinking, oh, gee, I'm probably in a minority. In addition, I think you want to psychologically move from being opposed to them towards what I've called a, a governing conservatism or towards creating a humanitarian Republican solution. That is, starting out with the idea that, and, and I believe this with the bottom of my heart, no child should be born without prenatal care. No young man should die in a, in a firefight in one of our cities. No child should go through school for 12 years and not be able to read their diploma. And we have an obligation to find the system solutions that change those facts. And if you have the courage to walk up to every door and to say at every door, Do you, are you satisfied with the current system? If not, join us. Let's work together. I think you're going to be astonished the number of doors that have people behind there who say, yeah, I'm with you. This stuff's crazy. But they never thought a Republican would show up. Now, in that framework, I want to give you four terms that I, you can use as you design your own campaign. Uh, we actually invented this in 1983, and it, one of them you'll recognize immediately because it became very famous in politics, and that's the concept of a wedge issue. Now, we actually sat around a room one day and tried to invent, how do you think about designing a campaign? There are four words here, and I, I want to walk you through them. Wedge, magnet, shield, and turf. Okay? Now, a wedge is real obvious. A wedge issue is an issue which divides your opponent from the people. You know, it, it's an issue which allows tax increases. Are, you know, if you watch the Texas Senate race, it's a terrific wedge issue for, for K. Bailey Hutchison to use on Kruger, because all she's got to do is go around the state and say, hey, I'm against the big tax increase. People yeah, I'm with you. Okay? Wedge issues are almost always anti-issues. This is what they're doing wrong. Just take most of the stuff Clinton lied about. Those are all wedge issues. Because he knew if he told the truth about him, he'd wedge himself away from the American people. Okay? Magnets are, here are the good ideas. This is what I will do that will make your life better. Now, there are two problems with magnet issues. One is it takes, I think, somewhere between six and ten times as much effort to communicate a magnet as a wedge because the news media can cover a wedge easier. So, and, and I can tell you this from personal experience. I can give one attack speech on Clinton, and I'll make three or four other networks. I can give 70 positive speeches about health care and not make a single network. So it's much harder to get a magnet issue out. But in the long run, they're more powerful. Because in the long run, they bond you and your supporters. The genius of Franklin Roosevelt was he created for a generation, a Democratic majority, bound to him by Social Security, by the New Deal, by the Works Progress Administration, by all the different things he did. And so magnets are the creation of good things. I, I would argue that wedges were very important under Jimmy Carter and in the first half of Reagan. Wedges were vital to George Bush's 1988 election. He would not have won without them. But for us in the future, magnets are incredibly more important. The third is a shield issue. And a shield issue is just, you know your opponent's going to attack you as lacking compassion. You better find a good compassion issue where, you know, you show up in the local paper holding a baby in a, in a neonatal center. And all you're trying to do is, is shield yourself from the inevitable attack. 
you're a woman and you know they're going to attack you as being too soft for the job and so you come out for a very tough crime position and you're seen in front of the jail saying, let's be tough on criminals. And it's very hard at that point for them to say you're soft. But the purpose of that issue is just to shield you. It's to stop their attack. The last is a turf issue. You drive Democrats nuts if you campaign on health, education, and the environment because they think they, earn that, they own that turf. So the simple act of being in the middle of it drives them crazy. And George Bush found that, that by running around and saying, I'll be the education president, he didn't have to convince anybody. It's just that the act of cluttering the Democrats confused them so much that just saying it drove them crazy. And so sometimes you just want to be in the middle of their turf to fight the war on their terms and to say to them, boy, I really do care about the environment. That's why when you voted to put that waste dump in our county, I thought you were being terrible. They go nuts because they're not used to the idea of a Republican suddenly competing with them on their own turf. So those are four concepts you ought to have in the back of your head as you start to design the campaign. All of your planning, whether it's planning as a candidate, planning for your campaign, or planning when you're in government, should occur at four levels. And this, this is one of the two most important things that I'm going to talk to you about as a specific technique. And the four levels are four words, so they're not hard to write down and remember. But they're very, they're very, very powerful if you can use them. The first level, the top, the hierarchically most important, the one that shapes everything else, is vision. What is your vision of what you're doing? You ought to be able to state your vision in one, ideally in a sentence or a paragraph, no more than a page. If it's more than a page, throw it away and start over. You start with your campaign. Why? What's your vision of your candidacy? Why are you running? And you ought to be able to get that down to a sentence or a paragraph. And you say you want to make a difference. What does it mean? It ought to be something which, when you say it, your grandmother can understand it. I mean, one of my tests, I, I have an aunt who helped raise me who, who's now dead. She lived into her 90s. And, and she didn't read very well, and she, and she would not have thought of herself as a sophisticated person, although she was a wonderful human being. And I try to always talk in a language that she and I could have communicated it. Because if she can't understand it, then I can't use it on television. And so you ought to have, what's your vision of your campaign? What's your vision of housing? What's your vision of health? What's your vision of education? Each of those, you ought to have a paragraph, no more. The second level is strategies, but don't get to the second level till you've done the first one. And, it's, and strategies are how are you going to achieve it? My vision is my campaign is going to have a thousand volunteers. Terrific idea. How are you going to get them? That's where strategies come in. The third level is projects. What is a sp and a project is very simple. It's a definable, delegatable achievement. Every one of you has ever said, go pick up the pizza knows what a project is like. Here is a list. Go to the grocery store and bring back the groceries. That's a project. Now, in a campaign, it becomes real important. Will you go down and open the new campaign headquarters? Will you take charge of decorating election night? Will you be in charge of turning out the vote? Each of those is a project. And at the bottom is tactics. What do you do every day? Let me give you two examples. A campaign whose vision of itself is television has to spend almost all of its strategies raising money. A campaign whose vision of itself is volunteers has to spend almost all of its strategies figuring out how to meet people. Very different models. A campaign which is going to spend most of its resources on television may say to the candidate, your major tactic is sitting in a room dialing for dollars. A campaign whose major goal is to have lots of volunteers may say to the candidate, your major tactic is to sit in a room and call and thank all the volunteers. Now, candidate looks on the surface like they're doing the same thing. They're picking up a phone and calling. They're, in fact, executing very different tactics to achieve very different projects, to implement very different strategies because of a very different vision of the campaign. And you've got to think through, what do you want to do so you have a coherence so all of those are reinforcing each other? And if I could only teach you one key habit of a politician that is very un-Republican, it's these four words. And it's a sequence. It, that is, the first one precedes the second. Listen, learn, help, 
and lead. I can't say this too strongly. Start every day by listening. Start every meeting by listening. When you walk up to somebody, listen to them. Okay? Don't start by telling them your idea. Start by getting their idea. Don't start by telling them your solution. Start by listening to their problem. Now, I used to be a bookworm, and I used to be very shy, and I used to hate cocktail parties. Because people at cocktail parties talk about drivel. All of you have been to cocktail parties where you stand there and you have nonsense conversations. And I learned one day that if you think of every American as a novel, and the trick is how to open the page, every American has had unique experiences. Uh, Jack Kemp has a wonderful phrase. He says, they don't care that you know until they know that you care. And if there's any single explanation of why we have failed to be a majority, it's that sentence. That we as a party are right, and they may even think we're right, but they don't think we're accessible. They don't think we'll be right for them. We don't they don't think we'll understand their world, whether they're, whether they're relatively poor whites, they're younger women, they're blacks and Hispanics. There's a whole range of groups who sort of say, gee, I think your theory's right, but I'm not sure I'll ever be able to explain my life so you could apply your theory to my life. And if you learn to listen, and listen in a way that you're truly learning, remember, that's the second word here, not transactionally listening, eyes glazed over, waiting for them to get done, but truly try and understand them. What a friend of mine describes as, as appreciative understanding. He said, it's not the same as either sympathy or agreement. I don't have to agree with what you just told me, but I have to appreciate that for you it's real. Then the third thing is help, and you'll be astonished how often somebody will be talking to you and you'll be able to give them a tidbit that will help them. Have you thought about it this way? Or maybe you should call your brother and chat with him. I mean, it's amazing. You help unlock people, and frankly, in the act of talking to you, they often unlock themselves. Now, if somebody knows you're going to listen to them, learn from them, and help them, they are eager for you to lead them. And you now have the base. You have the information to be a leader. You have the psychological relationships to lead. And you are prepared to lead. And when you start leading, the next morning, the first thing you should do is listen every day. Now, in that framework, let me just go back quickly. We're going to win when we act like a majority, which means it is our natural right to knock on every door. It's our natural right to appeal to everybody. We're going to win when we define our opponents as the minority, not attack them, just define them, and then leave them out there by themselves. We're going to focus on solutions. And we're going to be the party that offers real help to real people in a real way, that has a humanitarian Republican solution to real human problems. We're going to use our vision to develop our strategies so we can set up our projects so that we can tactically every day truly help our community. We're going to do all of that in a way which allows us to replace the welfare state, which is the key to developing a renewed American civilization. Let me say lastly, I believe that you have to think of yourself not just as a candidate, but as a citizen leader. Citizenship is a 365-day-a-year lifetime part of being an American. And this is very important, because all too often people say, well, I've really been a business person. Now I'll be a candidate for 90 days. Then I'll go back and be a business person. I ran for five years to win my seat. I think if I retire from this job and I go back to teaching or I go do something else, I will still be a citizen. I'll still have a job as a leader to try to help my community, even though it may not be a job in elective office. I think it's very important if you think that way because it changes. You see, if all you think of yourself is, I used to be in business, now I'm a candidate. If I lose, I go back to business. Then it doesn't matter what kind of campaign you run because you either win or lose. But if you're going to be a citizen the morning after, then you have to run a campaign worthy of a citizen. And that sets a higher standard. You can't quite lie, cheat, and smear. And it also doesn't scare you because if you lose this round, you'll still be there. You'll be a citizen the next day. Ronald Reagan lost in 1976, but he was still, he lost in 1968, was the first time he ran for president, but he was still a citizen. So you just keep coming. You're able to keep doing things. And as a, as a, as a, as a citizen leader, I think you have to basically do four things. First, 
you have to repeat our values. Just the fact of saying them strengthens them. Second, you have to protect our own members. It was incredibly helpful to Clarence Thomas that all over America people rallied to him. They didn't abandon him. And all over America people watched the, the television and they called. And it had a huge impact in the Senate. And I think, frankly, the fact that Bork had been destroyed by that process changed the anger and the intensity of our community in saying, we're not going to let it happen twice. You're not going to get away with it twice. Third, I think you've got to, inside your own community, manage the conflict and recognize you're not going to resolve it. It's a very important concept. When you get to be a majority, there are fights you can't end. And again, all of you who have families know this. I mean, you're, you know, you just, one of the kids always likes to go to Disney World, and the other kid always likes to go to movies, and they're always arguing with each other about it, and they're going to be arguing until they're 70 years old, and you might as well relax and let them argue. And finally, you have to focus on real results, and they don't have to be big results. Now, let, let me just wrap all this back up in, in one big ball of wax and, and, and bring it to, to a culmination. You've got to have, as a leader, an ability, I think, to have what Joe Gaylord described as the five C's in a book you've got there called Flying Upside Down. You've got to have confidence. You are the majority. The question, the question is, how fast can you translate that into political reality? It's clearly already a cultural reality. You have to have creativity. What are the devices you're going to use that are different, that are new, that are unusual? How do you get on talk radio? How do you get letters to the editor? How do you get an interesting campaign brochure worth looking at? You've got to draw a contrast between yourself and your opponent. If you really are us, why aren't they? What's the contrast that proves that? You've got to sooner or later have some controversy. The fact is, in the American system, people don't listen to non-controversy. And, and all of you just think about yourselves. I mean, you know, any, you know, getting your hair cut at the end of LAX airport and paying 200 bucks was a huge controversy. Now, I went, just to show you stylistically, my next haircut, we made a press availability. I got a $9 haircut at Great Clips in Marietta, Georgia, $3 tip. And uh, we got one quarter of the front page of the Marietta Daily Journal in a color picture sitting in the chair. Because in the paper's mind, it wasn't that they were covering me, but that they were, in, in the shadow effect, covering Clinton. This is the way a free society works. This is the way America works. So you look for a little controversy now and then. Because controversy is the hook that gets people, and all of you have done that. You're driving down the road, you're not thinking about it, the radio news is on. The right word, the right tone, the right phrase, suddenly you're really listening. That's what controversy is. It doesn't have to be hostile, it doesn't have to be conflict. Lastly, you want to have capital. We deliberately did not use cash. Example, instead of raising $150 in, you know, so you can afford to stay at a hotel, you have a volunteer in that city you can stay with. If your district is big enough that, you have to, that, that part of your district is always overnight, can you find a volunteer who likes you enough that they'll let you have a, have a room because they're, they're kids off to college and they have a spare room? Twelve nights there means you didn't have to raise $960. There are a thousand little ways, if you think in terms of capital and not just cash, in a society as rich as ours with the embedded infrastructure that we have, desktop printing, Xeroxing, fax machines. Instead of you spending 20 cents per fax, do you have a friend who has a fax? I mean, there are a thousand things like this that, that when you get in the habit of, of uh, much like a gorilla, living off the land, it is astonishing how you can lower the cost of your campaign and in the process involve more and more people so you have more humans involved so that you have a greater ability to win the election. We discovered, for example, that one of the problems of hiring paid phone banks was you didn't organize volunteers. One of the great virtues of organizing volunteers was not the phoning they did. It was the fact that all week they talked about how they were involved in the campaign. So they became missionaries to every person they ran into. Very different psychology if you think about capital and not cash. This collectively is the art of self-government. Let me just close with this thought, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This is the reason I do this. And I want to try to imbue each of you in this. You are missionaries for the survival of freedom. This is the most unbelievable, extraordinary experiment in human liberation ever undertaken. 
more people from more backgrounds, from more races, from more ethnic groups live as Americans and pursue happiness and seek opportunity than ever in the history of the world in any other civilization. And it only survives one generation at a time. And for the last several decades, we have been decaying. And you literally are the seed corn of the future. Whether you're running for delegate, or for state senate, or for statewide office, whether you're running for city council, or whether you're just a good citizen who wants to get involved and who wants to understand better how to help your neighborhood, how to help your country. I really believe you bear both the practical burden of making life better in a real way every day, and you bear the, the romantic, idealistic, moral burden of being the, literally the carriers of the future of the human race and the carriers of freedom both for America and for every child on the planet.